So it's 2018, and as we know, no conference is complete without a blockchain-themed uh, session. So I'm very happy to oblige, uh, and thank you very much to the Korea Press Foundation for hosting me and uh, all of the other speakers this week. Uh, I'm Matt Coolidge, co-founder and the head of marketing at Civil. We're building a community-owned and operated network of independent newsrooms that runs on, you guessed it, blockchain technology. What I hope to accomplish today, more than anything else, is to demonstrate how blockchain is a much more interesting and far-reaching technology than simply cryptocurrency and speculation, which are certainly its most well-known use cases to date, uh, and more specifically, how and why it is a very intriguing option for journalism in a number of ways. Uh, there was a period of hype and massive speculation, and a lot of people earned great amounts of wealth in a short amount of time, some for doing very little. Some even bought Lamborghinis, which quickly became one of the worst memes of 2017, 2018. Uh, full disclosure, I don't even own a car. I do own a small amount of cryptocurrency, about 0.00005 Bitcoin, very proud. Uh, but now that we're through the hype cycle and I think more ration and normalization is returning to the market, there's a great opportunity to start really focusing on interesting applications for blockchain technology that go far beyond cryptocurrency. Uh, it's just one application of a much broader feature set. The real potential, I think, in blockchain technology lies in its ability to form decentralized communities where there is no single party in charge and where all transactions are immutably recorded via a distributed ledger that no single party owns, where there is no point of failure and which anybody can access. Some of them, some examples uh, of this technology already in practice beyond cryptocurrency include supply chain management, where you can prove either exactly where your food came from uh, or that your engagement ring is not a conflict diamond. Healthcare, which introduces the ability to own and control your own medical records. Uh, and if you're like me, not have to constantly transfer them to from doctor to doctor and hope for the best. Uh, and finally, real estate, uh, proving that you own a given piece of property and not having to invest in cumbersome um, insurance and research practices. And of course, as we'll talk more about now, uh, journalism. So before going into the blockchain aspect, uh, I want to set the stage by saying a few things that everybody in this room knows and probably broadly agrees with. Journalism is currently facing twin crises around both trust and sustainability. Trust in the media is lingering near historic lows worldwide. As Tom Rosenstiel pointed out yesterday, this isn't new, and this isn't just because of the internet. We've been on a steady, precipitous decline since the mid-70s. The sad reality is that, with few exceptions, there's far more profit in pandering and polarization than there is in investing in ethical, rigorous journalism practices. Of course, the rise of the internet and the democratization of information that came with that hasn't helped things. It's all too easy for anybody to produce content today, and it's increasingly difficult for most people to distinguish the difference between said content and journalism and the work that goes into journalism. If I'm scrolling through my Facebook feed, YouTube, or on Twitter, which are by far the three most popular media-serving platforms around the world today, it's all too difficult to distinguish the well-reported, fully sourced and fact-checked article from the one that declares that Hillary Clinton is in cahoots with a bunch of DC area pedophile pizza parlor owners. People are becoming exhausted. Many are actively tuning out the news. They're sick and tired of feeling manipulated and having to parse fact from fiction when presented with it. These platforms are beginning to recognize the issue and they're taking steps to combat it, but it's not enough. Truly addressing the systemic issues plaguing these platforms would require a fundamental reimagining of their respective models. Their platform economies that exist to connect buyers and sellers at scale. None of them were initially built with journalism in mind. Their models are designed to capture your attention, keep your attention, and harvest your data. These organizations, I think, are, are well-meaning when they say that they care about journalism and that they want to help fix the mess that they have in large part wrought but I don't think they're organizationally capable of addressing the core issues without effectively starting from scratch. And that's not happening for publicly traded companies that have fiduciary responsibilities to maximize shareholder profits from one quarter to the next. So one more slide on the state of journalism and then we'll shift to the blockchain side of things. Um, 
I talked a little bit about trust in the context of platforms, but let's also look at sustainability and the idea that journalists are increasingly intermediated. There is a middleman or middlewoman that they need to go through to reach their readers and supporters. Sustainability is a massive existential issue. Together, Google and Facebook capture anywhere between 60 and 80% of digital ad dollars worldwide, depending on which studies you trust. These are the same ad dollars that once sustained print outlets, which continue to lay off staff en masse and shutter altogether. It also brings up a common misconception. It's not true that there's no longer any money in media. It's just been cornered by the Facebook-Google duopoly. They now sit between journalists and their supporters and impose steep tolls, both monetarily and over which content readers can more easily access, discover, and share. Journalists have lost control of the model. It's now small groups of technologists in Silicon Valley that determine how the majority of the public shares and discovers journalism. While they may not be malicious, I think we can all agree that it's a far from ideal scenario that Mark Zuckerberg or Sundar Pichai are journalism's ultimate power brokers in 2018. This is the dark side of Web 2.0, which celebrated social connectivity. It's a great notion, but losing control of your data and all that comes with that is not. Right now, we're in the middle of a shift from Web 2 to Web 3, which in its most ideal vision is promising a return to an open protocols-based system that prizes collaboration and shared information over the proprietary gathering of data and selling it to third parties at your expense. Um, I think it was Ariana that just referenced this. You know, If it's not obvious what the product is um, in most web platforms today, then you are most likely the product. Uh, I'm most excited about Web3's ideals, again, to democratize this and to return power to more transactional economies where creators and supporters are those that are carrying out the majority of transactions. So with that said, why blockchain? First, I want to state what blockchain can't do. It cannot suddenly fix journalism or anything else simply by sprinkling magical blockchain fairy dust on it. There was a brief period where I think some people may have thought that about a year ago, and uh, it has certainly been proven untrue and largely driven by speculators. What I think is very exciting about blockchain and what I'm really ex eager to talk to everybody here about today is its ability to form decentralized communities. And we're going to get a lot more into that concept and what it means in this context and more broadly uh, over the next few minutes. But the core idea is that no single party is in control. A given community is incentivized to promote and reward good behavior that helps the network grow. Like any community, governance matters in a decentralized environment. You can't simply rally a group of people together around a given cause and say, go. You need to establish clear parameters for the network. What are the barriers to entry? What are the rules of engagement? Is there a system of checks and balances to ensure that the community can't be easily co-opted by special interests that don't represent the majority viewpoint or the core purpose? In many ways, it's a radically new approach for journalism. Okay, 99% of the ways I'm referencing it is a radically new approach. But at a time where nothing else seems to be working at scale, why not consider it? It's also not inaccurate to think of a decentralized community in some ways as a meta membership model. If you enter into a network, you are afforded unique privileges over how key decisions are made and how that community evolves. A decentralized network is ultimately just a cooperatively owned and operated network. People that are in the network ultimately own the decisions and your level of participation uh, is roughly corresponding with your level of influence. They're also economically incentivized to see it grow as it can increase the value of their own stakes. And I should take a step back when I talk about that and we'll come back to the concept of a tokenized economy in a few minutes. But think of tokens as stakes or you know pieces of ownership in the model. Uh, and in a blockchain context, this is not necessarily equivalent to owning shares in a company. It really depends on how the network is structured and that's probably a larger conversation for another day, but certainly one I'm happy to engage with anybody here uh, with after this, this uh, conversation. But if I own tokens, I am entering into a unique incentive model where any behavior I take should be aligned with other members of this community and in the interests of growing it and bringing positive effects to it. This also uh, can play a more unique role in discouraging bad actors, malicious actors, um, trolls, and those who otherwise might want to co-opt the network. If you have this collectivized group of individuals who is all chasing the same thing, I think you're going to be much more effective or at least significantly increase your odds of success in 
achieving the end goal. So in the case of journalism and in this case of platforms, think about Facebook and one of the images we just saw in the last presentation where somebody complained about a piece of content being hateful and just getting this boilerplate message back from Facebook saying, thanks for your time, but no. Um, here are things you can do otherwise. And obviously that's a very oversimplified way to put it. But this is something that's come up a lot lately. Uh, for those in the US and perhaps even abroad, you probably followed the uh, imbroglio around Alex Jones a few weeks ago, the controversial conspiracy theorist who was recently deplatformed um, from Facebook, YouTube, and ultimately Twitter. Uh, for a while, a lot of Twitter users were complaining that he was clearly violating their terms of service, but Jack Dorsey, Twitter CEO, maintained that it was uh, anathema to his belief on free speech. The issue at hand here isn't what the outcome was in this case, it's that the community was not empowered to make the decision themselves. And when you're thinking about this token powered economy, this idea that you own a stake in the network, and that not only should your voice be heard, but there is an automatically enforceable way for your voice to be heard, becomes very interesting. And it comes back to what I was saying about this meta membership model. Um, in many ways, you are just affording unique privileges to users and giving them a reason to engage with you on a much deeper level. So beyond the idea of what a decentralized network or community can do, um, let's talk about the most exciting thing as it relates to journalism and sustainability. And that's the idea that in a peer-to-peer -peer network, there are new channels for value creation. Instead of having to go through an intermediary, um, either paying processing fees or just having somebody beyond the creator or the creator supporter determining what they want to see, um, direct transactions are enabled in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. So two examples that really underscore what this means and that has a lot of potential for journalists in the very near term um, are microtipping and licensing. So microtipping is certainly not a new concept. It's been a, a white whale for some newsrooms for years, uh, and it's traditionally been foiled by credit card processing fees. In most cases, it's simply not cost effective to enable a party to pay a journalist 25 cents when you're paying nearly as much in transaction fees. But again, in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network where there is no proverbial middleman or middlewoman, that concern is a moot point. Journalists can capture long tail value for their content that wasn't possible or was very difficult or unreachable before. Think about this scenario. A local journalist writes a story on a breaking news item that ends up spawning perhaps a screenplay that turns into a blockbuster film. Or maybe you have a policy focused journalist who writes a piece that ends up becoming highly influential in academic circles and informs a lot of research on a given topic over an extended period of time. In both cases, readers can access these original stories and directly pay the author to express their thanks or appreciation, weeks, months, and even years later. And again, because this is a peer-to-peer -peer network, you are sending a payment directly to the reporter, not his or her employer. So even if Jane Doe is no longer writing at The New Yorker, you can still rest assured that your payment is going directly to her via a unique wallet address that this individual owns and that she is capturing 100% of the value you sent. There are no third-party transactional fees going into it. Another revenue stream that becomes much more interesting in a blockchain-based environment is licensing. Media organizations today struggle to understand the impact of original content in many cases, to say nothing of the difficulties enforcing and monetizing licensing policies. Not only are creators not being fairly compensated for their work, but in many cases, they have no idea how broadly it's even been picked up or what its ultimate impact is. In this peer-to-peer -peer economy, you can digitally fingerprint content and dynamically set and enforce licensing policy. Think about a dramatic photo taken during a storm in New Orleans. Maybe it's taken by a photographer for a small local newsroom, and perhaps it's later picked up by a larger newsroom with a broader reach. Not only does this original creator gain a new ability to track the provenance or the track of its original image from being picked up at this publication and then syndicated to 10 or 20 other publications, but they can dynamically enforce licensing rights. So maybe they want to normally license this image for free or for a very nominal fee. But let's say because you have this dramatic image of a bolt of lightning striking you know, the harbor in New Orleans, that with an incoming major hurricane, um, demand suddenly and understandably spikes for similar images. The owner of this piece of content, because they have put this digital fingerprint on it and set their own licensing policy, can dynamically set and enforce new terms. So if I'm normally licensing an image for free just because I want to know where it goes, but I'm not looking to profit off of it, or for a very nominal fee, 
if I see a surge in demand in the network, I can raise the price for my image and make sure that I am fairly compensated for my work and that I can track where it goes. And again, this is the same scenario that I mentioned before. This is not just an immediate scenario. This can happen weeks, months, or years later because I, the creator, am licensing this image with my own unique address, not that of my employer or anybody else. So no matter where I go in my career, this address, this identity will follow me and I will be fairly compensated for what I created. So the idea here is that this is going to significantly extend the life cycle of content, both in the case of licensing that I mentioned and also with micro tipping. You, the creator of a given piece of, a given article uh, or piece of content, will have the ability to capture a much more significant amount of value over a much longer period of time in this peer-to-peer blockchain-based economy. And I just want to read one quick quote uh, from a woman named Amanda Gutterman, who is a pioneer in the Ethereum space and also chief marketing officer at Consensus, uh, a very uh, increasingly well-known and popular Ethereum venture studio and also an investor in, in civil. But I think she really puts it well in a broader context that sums up what I just said. There's a seismic shift coming in the, uh, excuse me, there's a seismic shift coming in the way we use the internet, from an internet of information to an internet of value. In this new world, our value is something we carry around with us that belongs to us and us alone, unless we opt to trade it. There's a new internet coming and with it a new reality. Certainly this is something that poses a lot of opportunity for journalists and journalism in general in terms of capturing new value. So now that we've established the why, I want to quickly speak to what is blockchain. Um, and before I get too deep into this, maybe just a quick show of hands in this room. Who feels vaguely familiar or confident with blockchain and how it works? I'm utterly shocked. <laughs> uh, me too. Uh, so no, at a high level, I mean, it's not an easy technology, but I think it's also rife with misunderstanding. And I think a lot of that goes back to what has occurred over the past 12 to 18 years and what people's conception are when they hear about blockchain or more specifically cryptocurrency. It's again, not just about Lamborghinis and empowering terrible people. Uh, there is a very, very transformative, exciting potential with building decentralized communities. So at the absolute core of blockchain technology is a thousand year old or many thousands of year old technology, a ledger. It is simply a source of information that is tracking transactions in a trustworthy manner. So just as merchants in the you know, 15th, 16th century would be capturing information on a ledger, so too is blockchain. The difference with blockchain is that this ledger is distributed to a massive group of individuals. Anybody who wants to participate can. Certainly as you get uh, deeper into blockchains like Ethereum or Bitcoin, uh, a lot more computing power is required for tracking these ledgers, but the idea is that information is accessible to all and behavior is always transparent and open um, and that collectives that are running these blockchains are incentivized to behave in the best interest of the community, not in their own self-interest. There's a, a term called crypto economics that is often used to describe the motivations of actors in these decentralized communities. And I think the best description I've ever heard of crypto economics is that it is a way to incentivize short-term selfish behavior to promote a greater collective good. And in the case of maintaining a distributed ledger, the idea is that if there is no trust in the system, the system won't work. So being able to cryptographically uh, block together transactions and add them to a chain is ultimately what blockchain is. Another crude way to think of it is really just a Google Docs on steroids. I can log into the same piece of information or document that anybody else or everybody else in this room can. And if I edit it in real time, you will see that. You will see that there is a revision history. You will see that if I said I changed something at 9.57 AM, there's going to be a record verifying that or saying that I did not. Uh, one other point that I think is worth calling out just on blockchain in general uh, is that there is no single point of failure. So unlike, say, this Google Docs scenario, ultimately Google owns Google Docs and can unplug it You know, if they ever chose. They own that central point of failure, the server or many, many servers in this case, that is running this information. What becomes so compelling about this idea of a distributed ledger with blockchain is that this Google document is simultaneously owned and operated by everybody and updated in real time. So anytime that there is a change or an update to the record, the entire community is notified as it happens and it is an immutable 
a verifiable manner to say that this transaction occurred when we said it did. So we'll get into uh, a little bit more journalism-centric context in a moment, but I mean, one very exciting initial application here is being able to permanently archive content, being able to say that I uploaded this piece of content, me, the journalist, at this specific time on this specific date from this specific location. And I can also prove that I updated it or you know, retracted it from the record on a website that I might be maintaining um, as, as that's called for. So beyond that, I wanted to also touch on one of the most popular themes uh, over yesterday and today, uh, knowing it's such a prevalent issue in this day and age and certainly in, in Korea in particular. How can blockchain uh, help combat myths and disinformation? So I just talked about the example of the journalist being able to prove uh, verifiably and immutably that they have created a piece of content when they said they would have. So when you think about the motives or incentives that a quote unquote bad actor might have when they go on to Facebook or Twitter or somewhere else to knowingly and deliberately propagate misinformation um, and try to manipulate the public. In this, this case, the level of transparency that comes with it is just not worth it. And you can very clearly prove when a piece of information was updated and if somebody is promoting it after it has been debunked, you can very easily point that out and just say, you know, there is a date and time that this has been debunked. And in certain decentralized networks, and we can get into civil in a moment, there can be additional incentive schemes to reward people for catching people in the act um, where there is not only an ideological but also an economic incentive to promoting good behavior and ensuring the network remains a trustworthy, safe destination. Uh, and then one other point, and this is actually probably a good segue to civil, which I'll say a couple of words about um, just in this context to better illustrate it. Rules matter. Um, what I just described is a very fascinating, complex, very lightly understood concept that holds tremendous potential, but also tremendous risk if we don't think through certain things the right way. So when you are creating a decentralized community and empowering them with a massive amount of influence potentially to wield um, in place of, say, a big tech company, you need to make sure that there are very thoughtful, um, strong parameters in place. So in the case of journalism, for example, we have no interest at Civil in trying to reinvent journalistic ethics. That's a pretty battle-proven, tried-and-true discipline that has evolved and is evolving over hundreds, if not thousands, of years. What we are trying to reinvent and what the idea of peer-to-peer -peer economies and decentralization enable is the way that journalistic excuse me, journalistic ethics are incentivized and how those who adhere to them are rewarded and how those who do not can face risk. So that brings me to civil. I'll say a couple words on this run through and then I'm sure there's uh, some questions that I wanna leave time for here. So civil is a global network of independently owned and operated newsrooms um, comprised of the journalists and then those who support them. So when I talked about this idea of a meta membership model before, that's really what civil is. Um, I will touch on a quick visualization in a moment to put this in context. At the core of civil is going to be this decentralized community that is going to be overseeing its governance, that is going to be working hand in hand with both the newsrooms and then a body called the Civil Council, which in some ways is almost like a Supreme Court-like model for ethical journalism on civil, to ensure that newsrooms are adhering to the quality standards set forth on civil and that if you are launching and producing content on this network that is defined as a home for ethical journalism, that you're adhering to these rules and that you can be deplatformed for not doing so. And it's not going to be my decision or anybody else at the civil media company or the civil foundation's decision. It's going to be driven by community consensus within these parameters of ethical journalism. So the hope is that on civil, there's going to be no scenario like we just saw with Facebook, where you just get a terse letter saying, you know, thanks for your concern, but we are not going to remove this person. Ultimately, anybody in the community is going to be empowered to say, I think that there's a violation of the rules taking place here. Here's why. Let's vote. Um, so beyond the self-governed platform, um, I mentioned this is under underlied by a token economy. There's going to be a small group of newsrooms and engaged citizens that are ultimately driving this model. It is open and available to anybody, but certainly it is not a barrier to entry if you simply want to come onto this network and read and support ethical journalism. You can do that just as you would on ProPublica, on the Wall Street Journal, 
on any known publication today by pulling out your credit card and supporting the newsroom with whatever membership or subscription model they have uh, employed to monetize content. So I mentioned beforehand just visualizing the network a little bit, and I think this is one way to think about it. We call this the waterline. Um, readers and supporters are going to be the vast majority of our audience. Um, only a very few initially will be participating in this governance model because it is such early days for blockchain-based technology. Uh, it is not a remotely user-friendly experience right now. I am intimately familiar with that and happy to chat more with, uh, with folks about that later as well. Um, and yet it is possible now to launch such a decentralized network. So at the core, you have these community members and even within them, the creators that are going to be driving the majority of content. But for the vast majority of people coming to this network, they're going to go directly to the custom URL of whatever newsroom they may choose. They're going to support it if they choose with a credit card, with monetary contributions. They certainly can pay in cryptocurrency if they like, but we expect that that will be a very small number. And the idea and the benefit for newsrooms of running on civil in this case is really twofold. One, there's just a very, and I'll actually move forward here. Nope, I think that this is an old, here we go. Uh, if you look at the very top right corner, you see that small badge that says this newsroom runs on civil. We will be maintaining a registry of all newsrooms that adhere to these journalistic principles that are staked into the network. But most people are just not going to care about that, and that's perfectly fine. The idea is that we want to empower independently owned and operated newsrooms to set their own model, to control their own model, and to not be disintermediated by a platform. We think that the platform economy model works phenomenally well in terms of connecting buyers and sellers, including journalists and would-be supporters, at scale. But we do not want to undermine that uh, by taking the power from journalists. We think that there is a tremendous opportunity to hand this back over to them. And beyond having this trusted marketplace, what we're ultimately trying to do, which has nothing to do with blockchain, is simply build an experience where the startup cost to launch a new newsroom is lower than what you would find on the open market. We've built a suite of publishing tools that are right now built on WordPress that allow you to publish to the blockchain. We have a number of big partnerships, some public, some not. Uh, the Associated Press is probably the most significant one that we've announced to date. But in this way, as a platform economy, Civil is really just trying to allow journalists to have an easier way to create and monetize newsrooms than what they'd find in the open market, similar to maybe what Airbnb does if you want to rent your apartment, what Uber or Lyft do if you want to drive a car. It's really just making it an easier way to engage in this large transactional platform economy. Uh, and so this newsroom here, uh, being mindful of the fact that we are in the show don't tell era, is one of the initial newsrooms that's formed on Civil called Sludge. Um, and this just gives you a sense of what the UI looks like for people coming in. And I want to just say a couple of words now about the initial newsrooms that are already publishing on the Civil network. There are 18 of them so far. Um, that number is going to significantly expand, we hope, in the near future when we launch the network. Um, but there's a lot of symbolism in the initial newsrooms that we provided grants to be the first to publish on the network. We chose to focus on local policy and investigative uh, based newsrooms because we see those as three areas that have been among the hardest hit from 20 plus years of mass media consolidation and where we think there is a considerable demand for more content. Um, so we're really thrilled and honored with some of the journalists that have already come on and written with us. Just a couple I'll call out here for the symbolic value in this day and age of journalism. Uh, Larry Rickman from the Colorado Sun was formerly a senior editor at the Denver Post, um, which for anybody that follows the newspaper business in the US uh, is well aware has faced a very challenging couple of years since they've been owned by Digital First Media, um, which is a subsidiary of a hedge fund called Alden Global Capital that is known in the US for owning and frankly gutting and destroying uh, many, many local newspapers. So the team at The Sun was fed up. They were actually turning a profit even after three years in which the newsroom had gone from about 300 reporters to fewer than 60. And yet it still wasn't enough. The margins always need to be widened. Uh, so they left and formed uh, the Colorado Sun, which is a new local newsroom on Civil. Similarly, uh, Jen Sabella on the left-hand side at Block Club Chicago uh, was formerly a senior editor at DNA Info, which again uh, was a very popular local news publication in the US that was suddenly and quite unexpectedly shuttered uh, just about a year ago by its billionaire owner. Uh, and suddenly Chicago was left without any 
neighborhood news source. It was, uh, I should say, focused on Chicago and New York City primarily. So Jen and a number of her uh, colleagues from DNA Info came to Civil to form Block Club Chicago. And I bring this up in this context because when I just showed that waterline image before and why we are very confident that more and more people in time will gravitate to the governance model, they're not coming because they care about blockchain-based journalism. To most people outside the, this room, that is not a very intriguing or compelling topic, and we recognize that. They're coming because they want better local news. And Block Club Chicago, which just launched in June, has already surpassed 5 million uh, unique views, which is a really, really impressive milestone that we're very excited and proud of them for. We have seen a lot of people just coming from them saying, where did this newsroom come from? How is this happening? Where did DNA Info go? And that's a model that we want to replicate not only across the US, but really around the world. And I think local newsrooms in particular are a very, very promising medium to do that. Certainly in Europe and Asia, parts of Korea, we recognize that there is a similar demand for more local news as it's become harder and harder to fund. And then I talked a little bit about journalism ethics. Um, I think the last thing I wanted to share just for this room is a quick overview of the civil council. And so what their role ultimately is, is to work hand in hand with the larger community of civil token holders to define and uphold what constitutes, broadly speaking, ethical journalism on civil. We have a document called the Civil Constitution, which is effectively our rule set for this decentralized network, where I talked before about rules mattering. These are the individuals that are ultimately going to be working with the community to evolve the civil constitution. And in the case of a newsroom being challenged for being unethical, um, if the community consensus votes against a newsroom and yet they feel that they have been unfairly maligned, they can appeal to this body. And this is a group of people that we feel very confident will uphold a very strong degree of journalism ethics uh, and that will not let mob rule come along where, you know, in a worst case scenario, if a special interest group tries to co-opt a majority of the voting network, um, the recourse still exists where any one party can appeal to this group and they can overturn a decision that has deplatformed a newsroom. And then finally, just a quick way to visualize what civil is, um, because there's a lot of components here we recognize. The larger civil network is anybody who has civil tokens. So that's any newsroom running on this network. And then any other engaged citizen who wants to enter into this, again, what I call a meta membership model. On either side of the civil network, you have two bodies that are existing to promote uh, its growth and uh, ongoing adherence to ethical journalism. So the civil media company is going to be building software and services to enhance the experience for journalists and readers. Uh, we will make money through these software and services. We will never take a cut from any payments that readers pay uh, directly to journal or to newsrooms. It's something we don't believe is in the spirit of what we're trying to do, but certainly in applications like licensing and elsewhere we will. And you know, an example of this is just you know we could build a micro tipping functionality that exists much more intuitively in the UX, similar to maybe if you take an Uber at the end of the ride, you're asked to, prompted really, to give a tip of $1, $2, $3. That same type of uh, UX feature could be built in and could be sold as a widget for a newsroom. On the other side of the civil network, uh, we have the civil foundation. And this is again what hosts, uh, houses the civil council that I just shared on the last slide. Their role is going to be primarily to write grants to support new newsrooms, especially those uh, representing underrepresented voices around the world on the civil network. They will also be conducting original research into journalism uh, trends and sustainability trends on civil. And then finally, just a quick word on civil tokens. Um, the reason that we are building this token powered network is because it allows us to set the parameters. If you were doing this simply in USD, Korean wands, or even ETH, you would not be able to control the initial participants in the network. And it would be much easier for shadowy parties that have different interests that are already staked into an existing system to effectively lurk before they could come in and impact how the platform is governed. By creating a new token, we can actually set parameters that say, if you were coming here, you are saying that you want to use this token for its stated purposes, that you are somebody who cares about journalism, and most importantly, that you are not a speculator. Uh, so this is exactly what we did when we distributed civil tokens, and it worked, uh, I would say, too well. We, uh, as some people might know in this room, uh, conducted a token sale uh, over the past month, and it was ultimately not successful. 
there were a lot of factors that went into that and certainly a lot of learnings that we've taken from it, including just the need to simplify our message, what we're trying to do, um, and also just recognizing the changing market dynamics around us. But I think even more importantly, and what we are very pleased with is the fact that nearly 3,000 people uh, did register to purchase these civil tokens. And our initial goal was to bring between two and 4,000 people into the network to be the initial members of this governance model. Um, so to that end, we were able to validate the demand. We're very excited and we now need to come up with a better distribution scheme to get these tokens into the hands of these engaged actors. And that's precisely what we're doing now. But they really exist for two primary purposes to either launch your own newsroom or sponsor somebody else that uh, you want to do so. And that allows you to have access to this publishing suite, including um, permanently archiving content on the blockchain. And it also allows you to vote, to participate in community discussions and decision making. Um, and so those are the primary use cases of tokens. And that is the idea of this more engaged membership model below the waterline, if you will, beyond just engaging with a single newsroom or supporting it um, monetarily. So finally, I just wanna make sure that uh, if I leave you with nothing else, there are three key takeaways that you walk away from this presentation with. First and foremost, blockchain is not just about cryptocurrency. I'm not gonna use the word Lamborghinis again, but uh, it's it's been a point of uh, personal madness for the past year. There's a lot more to blockchain. It's long-term promise is much less about cryptocurrency and much more about the idea of decentralized governance or building these communities where no single party is in control and a group of individuals is collectively incentivized to promote good behavior, make good decisions and directly impact the outcome of that. Two, there is no magic uh, solution when it comes to blockchain. It takes a lot of work, a lot of thought about how you're going to form a network. But it does introduce a radical new degree of transparency. And when we look at trust as one of these two twin pillars of what is really plaguing journalism today, I think more transparency is a very good thing, a very important thing, uh, and also fosters more of a sense, I think, of participation and engagement between readers and journalists. And then finally, blockchain offers tremendous potential to create new value between journalists and their supporters via these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. So that's it for me. Um, happy to take any questions you have now. Thank you. <웃음> 네, 뜻깊은 강연해 주신 맷 쿨리지 대표님 감사합니다. 이어서 질의응답 시간을 가지도록 하겠습니다. 첫 번째 질문 보시겠습니다. 블록체인 저널리즘 모델은 사람들이 좋은 뉴스를 얻기 위해 많은 노력과 시간을 투자하는 것을 전제로 하고 있는 것 같습니다. 정말 그런가요? 그리고 현실적으로 사람들이 그런 노력을 기울일까요? So the short answer is it depends. Oh, that's deafening. Um, I don't think that we can reasonably expect a large group of people to do that, but I think it looks uh, calls back to what I just said about this initial distribution of tokens. If we can get to a critical mass of even 3,000 people around the world, we think that that is uh, enough to launch the foundation for a very strong network. I think one way to think about this that really has helped is the different ways you experience civil in some ways are not dissimilar from Wikipedia. Most of us just go there because we see it as a reliable source of information. You're in, you're out, you get what you need. Once a year, Jimmy Wales asks me for $10 and I feel awful for not giving it to them. And yet you have below that, this very engaged community of editors. I know that they exist. I know that if I really wanted to, I could be part of them. Uh, but the reality is I probably don't have enough time right now. We're pursuing a pretty similar model initially. Um, so I think as long as we get to that requisite minimum of a couple of thousand of individuals, including newsrooms, they're the only ones who must participate in this governance model as a barrier to entry. Getting to a couple thousand, I think, can bring us to a place where we can very quickly grow and scale and prove the, the model. 네, 다음 질문 보시겠습니다. 블록체인은 탈중앙화된 저널리즘의 생태계나 다른 분야의 시스템 변화에 대해 강조해 왔지만 프라이빗 블록체인은 사실상 탈중앙화가 아니며 퍼블릭 블록체인의 경우 새로운 생태계의 비전을 제대로 제시한 성공 사례가 없다는 비판을 받았습니다. 수많은 코인들이 난립하고 사라지는 지금 이 시점에서 
블록체인이 실물 가치가 없는 단순 투기판과 달리 건전한 재정을 기반으로 실물 경제와 긴밀한 크립토 이코노미를 과연 제시할 수 있는지 그리고 가능하다면 과거와는 다른 어떤 접근이 필요한지 궁금합니다. So it's a great question. There's a couple of different uh, items to tackle there. I'm going to largely punt on private blockchains. It's not my background. I don't know a lot. And I do believe in many cases they're just fancified data centers. Um, but I think your point about, again, the past year and just behavior and sentiment driving this industry right now is a very valid one. What Civil is trying to do is deliberately target people who are not active cryptocurrency enthusiasts, who are not speculators. There are two very different mindsets at play here. And this is certainly not to say that if you've previously owned cryptocurrency, we don't want you as part of the network. We do. Uh, but it just comes down to what your motives are. You should not come to Civil because you think it's going to be the next great coin that's going to make you a millionaire. It is not. We've actually put very deliberate controls around it to ensure that there will not be runaway appreciation. You should come to Civil if you are fed up with the status quo of journalism and if you want to play a more active, more direct role in the process of creating, distributing, sharing, and supporting journalism. So I think those are two very distinct areas, and certainly we face a very considerable challenge, both as a company Civil and also as an industry in blockchain that has done a terrible job of marketing itself and of stating how it works and why you should participate to date. So the onus really rests on us to build a very intuitive user experience that is going to make things as easy as possible while also recognizing that certainly within the first couple of months and probably even years of Civil's existence, there's a lot that is still going to be prohibitively difficult. Um, so we need to really bank on the fact that there are enough people out there, that there is a critical mass of individuals who feel this sense of urgency um, around the journalism industry today, who are frustrated by the status quo, who feel disenfranchised and who see the opportunity here to play a more direct role. I don't think that's going to be hundreds of thousands of people within the first year. I certainly think within a couple of years with improvements in user experience and validating this model that's possible. But do I think we can get to thousands or even tens of thousands within the first year? Yes.